this it is Wednesday afternoon, January 10th, 2024. Can you believe it? <laughs> and praise the Lord, we're back together. So welcome back from a lengthy break. I believe December 10th, 23 was the last time we were together. If you're looking for missing videos, they're not there because they're not missing. <laughs> but we'll pick up today in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 30 and verse 25. It was a good place to stop where we could pick up easily because we have the time now that Yaakov, Jacob, has worked his 14 years. Seven for Rachel, Rachel, got surprised with Leah and said that he'd work seven more. We saw from the way that his phrase just very clearly, though, and we know because we've gotten through, and we'll see we're down to child number 11 in verse, I think it's 25, we'll be talking about, yes, when... Rachel had born Yosef, Joseph. He's the 11th son born to Yaakov, so we know that he didn't wait to marry Rachel till the seven, next seven years had ended. He went through the marriage week with Leah and then married Rachel. So he got two wives in eight days. That's a lot for any of them, all of them. <laughs> but uh, he had promised Levon, Laban, um, their father, that he would work in exchange for Rachel. And then when he got Leah, he said, okay, I'll work on seven more for Rachel. This has now been completed. So with that having been done, Yaakov is free of his pledge. He can do what he wants with his life now. And that's why we read, picking up in verse 25 of chapter 30. Now it came about when Rachel, when Rachel had born Yosef, Joseph, that Yaakov, Jacob, said to Laban, Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Okay, Rachel had been barren for about six years. This is her firstborn. Uh, she's given Yaakov her handmaid and had children through her, but this is her very first uh, one that is born. But it tells us in the, the seven years that Yaakov has had his two wives, he's had 11 sons born to him during that time. So he went from not being a daddy to wow. And remember, he, he, close, he was close to 90 in age when he went. So we're not talking a youngster in his 20s, but he still was viral, obviously, and even with the work that we'll see that he does. But having it be completed, what he had pledged to, he's saying, send me away. My time is done. So he's letting Levon know he's ready to move on. He's ready to go to the next stage of his life. And he says in verse 26, Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me depart. For you yourself know my service which I have rendered you. Okay, I've given you what I promised, and you know it. Let's go. Or, you know, let me go. Now Laban had had a good thing with, with Yaakov. He had had 14 years of excellent service. Uh, Yaakov had kept his flocks, taken care of them, and Laban had prospered. We'll see that as we go on. So Laban's not going to be quick to want to release Yaakov, Jacob. So Laban, Laban said to him, verse 27, If it now pleases you, stay with me. I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. Now, you might have, if you have an older version, the King James, that you might say, I've learned by experience. Basically, though, what we're seeing because of the word divination that is in the Hebrew being used, that Levon said he ascertained it by magic, that he had a way that told him that you, he, Levon, has been blessed because, uh, because of the God of Jacob, in essence. So he basically said, I've observed the omens. I divined it. I've um, maybe he consulted a soothsayer or one, one who was called an oracle, which meant that they were a person who would give a wise and authoritative um, opinion. But it would be more like this is decision making. They would tell them how to how to go, what to do. In chapter thirty one and verse nineteen, we'll see that Levon is still into this type of mix with knowing the, the, about the true God of Israel, he didn't let go of his um, idolatrous ways. Let's just look at it real quick so you understand what I'm saying. It's only a chapter over, so easy for you to turn to. Chapter 31 
and verse 19 gives you a sneak peek for what's coming anyway. We have there, when Laban, Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel, Rachel, stole the household idols that were her father's. Okay, those household idols were what they thought would give them information. And that's, that could be he went to, and prayed before those idols or whatever he did. Again, they were practicing divinations. They were observing signs. Um, this mixed belief, the root, the word is nahasti, but the root of the word is nahash. When we get into the, the Hebrew word for divining, um, that we have either saying omens or experiences, it's very interesting that same root for that word is the root is the word serpent. Okay, so divining, omens, you know, looking into that, we get the same off of the same root word, we get the word serpent. Now, why is that the same root? Why do they you give us the word serpent? Because the root means to hiss. And who hisses? The serpent. So that's why if the root's saying to hiss, they tied it into meaning, oh, this is the serpent. So they combine these two. The idea is that this hissing is whispering, and we know it would be whispering evil omens. In heathen rites, the worship of the serpent is connected with magic. And we know that false religion, sorcery, we can trace it all the way back. The father of it all is the serpent, the dragon, the one that we call Satan. It's also interesting, out of the same root, when the vowels are changed, but out of the same root, we get the word nechash. It's very close from nachash to nechash. And in, uh, in, um, when we interpret it, that means copper or bronze. And in scripture, copper or bronze, like when they were parts of in the tabernacle and so forth, it always stood for judgment. So if you go into the evil, the almonds, you're, you're a tool of the serpent, you're working or looking to the serpent, you're in danger of judgment. And actually a judgment of God will fall on the serpent one day and completely take him away from being able to, uh, to, put, to express his venom on this world. I'll put it that way. So interesting side note on what it's saying. But obviously, Levon was not looking to the one true and living God for his guidance and for his wisdom. That's not where his bend was. He's heard that and seen that in Yaakov, who knows the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. But yeah, obviously, at best, Laban is mixing it, just bringing in the truth alongside his false ways of, of religious practices. And I'll put it that way, because... For us, we know the belief in the God of Israel is not a practice, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say. So he's saying that he he's divine from these omens, from these different ways, that the Lord has blessed him, blessed Laban, on account or because of, for the sake of Yaakov. Now, God did promise, chapter 28, and verse 15, we do know that God promised Yaakov that he would be with him. He would take him to uh, put on a wrong where he is, where he was to meet his wife, and he would bring him back to the land of Israel, actually at this time called the land of Canaan, Canaan, but he would take him back safely. God had promised in uh, earlier in chapter 28, also verse 4, you can look at it on your own, but take it all the way back to chapter 12 and verse 3, where God promised Abraham and his descendants. This was the land that he was giving to them. He would take Abraham to that land, and it would be for Abraham and his descendants, whom uh, Yahweh, Jacob, is one of. So Jacob is standing on the promises of God. And God is blessing him in accordance with God's word because God made an unconditional covenant. That's why even a rebellious Israel today is in the land because God is faithful to her and why we know what her future end will be, which will be glorious because she'll finally be right with her God. But he never quits on her because he never said it's dependent on you being good. It's dependent on you being right. 
is dependent on you being faithful. There's my alarm to pray for the hostage release. Um, but it is dependent on our God's faithfulness, and he's showing his hand faithful even to this day. So in a sense, Levon is right. Yes, God is blessing Levon because Jacob is there in his household, and that's what he has noticed. So as we go on, let's see what else he says in the account. Um, let's see, we're back to chapter 30, and we're picking up in verse 28. Then he continued, and he's speaking, Laban, Levon, speaking to Jacob. Name me your wages, and I will give it. Okay? Basically, what he's saying is, is set it, designate it, name your price. What do you want, Yaakov, so that you'll stay and work for me? Before, you were willing to work for Rachel. You could continue to work for her another seven years. Now, you name your price this time. What, what do you say? And I'll give it to you. But he, uh, Jacob said to Levon, you yourself know how I have served you and how your cattle have fared with me. The cattle is the livestock, the sheep, everything. It doesn't just mean cows. In fact, it probably wasn't cows. It probably was more sheep because we know Rachel was tending her father's sheep when Yaakov met her and he continued to help her in that. But the, the word cattle is kind of like a generic term for it at all. So, you know how your cattle have fared. For verse 30, you had little before I came and it has increased to a multitude. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? When it's saying that the Lord has provided, um, how did I just read that? Whoops. Oh, I closed my Bible. Sorry, folks. Okay. Um, okay. It, I'm looking again. Really, sorry, sorry, sorry. It changes in different versions. So in the one that I just read, wherever I turned, okay, Jacob's saying, whatever direction I went in, God blessed. The Hebrew says, at my foot. Whichever direction his foot went in, God blessed him. I bring that out because we read in Psalm 119, 105, or 11. No, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I think Yaakov had it right. Wherever my feet were, you were lighting the path. You were guiding me on my way. And at, because of God, the God of Israel, you were blessed. Now, Jacob's saying, I need to provide for my own family. I'm a husband. I have two wives. I've got 11 children. I need to be caring for my own. So it's time I've got to be thinking about myself, about my family. So if I keep working for you, you know, what's this going to do for me? So verse 31, he said, what shall I give you? Laban asked, okay, then what do you want? You need to take care of your family, your household. What do you want? And Yaakov very wisely says, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will give pasture and keep your flock. I'll work for you again. There's only one thing that I'm going to ask of you, Levon, and if you meet that, then I'll work for you. What he's going to do is be very smart. He's not looking to Levon to provide for him. He is not looking to him to take care of Jacob. He's looking to the God of Israel to do that. And he's going to say, basically, as we go through this, I'll work for wages now. You'll pay me, but we'll let God decide what those wages should be. He's going to set it up where it's up to God to provide for Jacob according to the way that God feels is right for Jacob. Not putting himself into Laban's hands and at Laban's call. Okay, very, very wise, because Levon is not, Laban is not a godly man. So, I'm not asking for anything from you, but this one thing I want you to agree with. Verse 32, let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted sheep and every black one among the lambs, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. So see, the flocks he's taking care of are sheep and goats, okay? So what he's saying is all the black, you may have brown in, you know, versions are different, but the meaning is the same. Um, in the Hebrew, it was the black sheep among the lambs. This was the off-breed. This was the, um, the considered second best 
they weren't the best quality, okay? According to, if they went to market, they'd get more for, for the others, for the solid colors. They were considered the stronger and so forth and so on. So he's naming his wages, okay? He's naming his higher, if you have that word. And by the way, in Syria and in the East, the majority of the sheep were white. The goats were black with very few exceptions finding spotted, speckled, so forth, very few exception. So Jacob isn't asking for a lot. He's not asking for the best, and he's not even asking for these because, sorry, because we're going to see he's separating them right now, but he's not separating them for himself. He's literally going to start with nothing, okay? As we go on, I'll bring this out very clearly to you, but that's why he knew he was putting himself into God's hands, that it was going to be up to God what gets produced out of these animals because that's where he's going to get his hire, get his pay. It's going to be through genetics, through the laws of heredity. It's going to be through the hand of God. It's not going to be because... Jacob's given himself a head start or taken advantage of Levon or anything else. So basically, Yaakov wants to start his own business, but he's going to do it with nothing. Okay, how do you do that? <laughs> Follow and you'll see. And it's also um, by him knowing it would be by God's hands. So he's separating the animals now. If he separated them, the idea is they can't breed with each other. So the strong, solid colors are not going to mix with the genetically appearing weaker animals. If any are born that are speckled, spotted, so forth, the lesser desired, the, the weaker, those will be Yaakov's uh, own flock. But he's setting himself up for it to be, as far as they're concerned, a black is, is most likely to produce another black. A white's going to produce a white. These are the mutations that he's saying. When it doesn't go quite right, I'll take those. You keep all the other. Okay? And this way, if he gets a lot, it's because God's favored him because he shouldn't. He should be getting few and he should be getting weak animals, not something that's going to be appealing and helpful and advantageous for himself. So where do we pick it back up again? I think verse 32. Yes, let me pa pass through your entire flock today, removing from there every speckled spotted sheep, every black one among the lambs, a spotted speckle. I did read all that. Sorry. Verse 33. So my honesty will answer for me later. When you come concerning my wages, when you come to see what I get, you're going to come look through the flock. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if they're found with me, you'll know they were stolen. It'll be considered stolen because you've got all of those. So my flock's going to only be the speckled, spotted, etc., etc. Okay? Well, what he's doing basically is setting Levon up very well and himself very poorly. So what do you think Levon's going to say? <laughs> Sure, let's go for it. And that's exactly what he says in verse 34. Good, let it be according to your word. Now notice verse 35. Jacob had said that he'd go through and he'd separate them. But in verse 35, the so he removed on that day, Laban did it. Levon himself did it. He removed the striped, the spotted male goats, the speckled and spotted female goats, everyone with white in it, and the black ones among the sheep, and he gave them into the care of his sons. So basically, he didn't trust Jacob to separate them right, even though Jacob said, you can come look through my flock, and if you see any that are solid color, you'll know I stole them, they should be yours. I'll get in trouble for that. But still, he, Levon's just gonna, he's a manipulator and he's a controller, so he grabs all of those that are already born, speckled, spotted, all that. He puts them in together and puts them over where his sons now are going to take care of them. Remember, Jacob's been taking care of everything. I'm sure the sons were helping, but Jacob was free to take care of the entire flocks. Now, Levon's sons will take care of those speckled. Levon will have the, 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 um, pure so, the pure breeds, thank you, the solid ones, and Jacob is to take care of those. 
so that they should produce more of the, the, the solid colors, and those will all stay with Levon. Jacob's only going to get speckled, spotted when they come out of Levon's and have been never touched his son's flocks. Okay, I hope I'm making it clear. You can get confused in this, but I think I'm making it clear. He not only separates them himself, but verse 36, he put a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Levon's flocks. So he took those spotted, speckled, everything that he thinks Jacob might sneak and take for himself, and he puts them three days away from where Jacob's going to be taking care of his solid, pure breed, good, desirous flocks, okay? He's set himself up well. He thinks he's in charge. He's got it all over Jacob. Jacob's going to be getting next to nothing, okay? I am in... I think, I think I've said it all. Okay, so um, I'm looking at verse 36 to make sure I didn't forget. Oh, okay. So bottom line, Jacob has no capital to start with. He doesn't own any. Laban owns them all, split them with his sons. Jacob's starting with nothing, okay? And being set up so that they can't breed in a way that will be favorable to Jacob. That is... It's significantly poor for Jacob. Now, Jacob, having been the main caretaker and all that he had done for 14 years, only to receive the two girls, he easily could have bargained for some of Levant's. He could have easily taken something for himself, but he makes it as difficult for himself and as generous for Levant as possible and puts himself totally into the Lord's hands and allows this three day of separation yeah, it's because Levon doesn't trust Yaakov, but Yaakov just goes along with everything. He doesn't give Levon any grief. So here we go. What happens? We've got Yaakov taking care of the favored flock of Levon. Verse 37. Yaakov, Jacob took fresh, let's try it again, fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white stripes in them, exposing the white which was in the rods. Okay, you may have strips, you may have strikes, you may have all kinds of different words, but basically he peeled back on this the, the wood and made this white appear, okay? Probably there was a chemical substance in the wood of the trees that was a fertility promoter, um, there are those that they believe in the Middle East to this day, that back from ancient times, still being used in modern times, that they do believe help spur fertility, okay? So that's what he's working with is the way that they did things. In verse 38, he set the rods which he had peeled in front, <laughs> which he had peeled. i got to make sure my words are clear. In front of the flocks in the gutters, even in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, and they made it when they came to drink. Okay, they, they conceived. They got frisky with each other. The flocks came into heat before those rods. Now that doesn't mean instantly, and it doesn't mean that their eyes looked at it and suddenly they get pregnant, but it was believed, like I said, maybe even putting it into the water and they're drinking it, that it stimulated fertility within the, the uh, females. It, uh, we do see that they bring forth, and I think that's our, uh, well, I've said that they were, they made it, okay? They bring forth, they made it, that's the law, you know, heredity. Um, we all come from before, so yes, they're mating, and they are going to have offspring, but God is the one in control of what that offspring is going to be. Now, some <laughs> people say that, that Jacob was using trickery, he used these stripes on these rods to make striped babies. <laughs> really? Well, then how come he got speckled and spotted also? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And so any who think that, that this was some sort of trick that Jacob could pull off, no, it wasn't. The best it could be is if there was something that helped stimulate. Just like someone who goes to the doctor today get help in area and gives, is given something to stimulate. That would be the best that it, it could be saying. 
Okay, so what happens? They're mating and they're going to have little babies, aren't they? That's what comes forth from this. So in verse 40, we see Jacob separated the lambs, made the flock's face toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Levon, and he put his own herds apart, and he did not put them with Levon's flock. So it's just going on and telling how he took care of them. If birth was given and it was a spotted one, Yaakov went to the extreme again. So that since that was looked at as a weaker one, he didn't leave it in the flock with the, the uh, preferred, the solid colors. He separated them so that they would only be mating with each other, with other weak ones, and the favored ones would continue to mate with the, the better, the stronger. Okay, now in doing this, with Jacob separating them, he's not hurting himself either because he's allowing any of them to get pregnant. He's not stopping them. He's not keeping the boys on one side and the girls on the other, okay? He's allowing nature to, to, uh, to happen. He, he's looking at the husbandry of it all, that it will be blessed by God, and if the herd, the, the flocks are blessed, both are going to prosper, Levon and Jacob, because if they have solid colors, Laban gets them. If they have the spotted or speckled, Jacob gets them. So he's allowing it to just go forward and knows that God is in control as to what will be born. It, you know, it's not that he's got any um, way to control it. He's just allowing God. So he does the wise thing, and when the, the stronger ones, verse 41, when the stronger ones of the flock were mating, Jacob would put those rods in the side of the flock in the gutter so that they might mate by the rods. So he knew, okay, these are the stronger ones. These are the ones we want to mate. That's when he would put those rods in the water. And when the weaker ones, verse 42, the flock that was feeble came to water to drink, he didn't put it in. He didn't want a feeble, weak uh, goat or sheep struggling to give birth to another weaker sheep so he wouldn't enhance their opportunity to be fertile he would just do that with the stronger ones and if anything that should have benefited Levon not himself but what happens we find out in verse 43 so the man referring to Jacob to Yaakov he became exceedingly prosperous he had large flocks and he had female and male servants and camels and donkeys he got so blessed, he had to hire other workers to help him. He also got camels and he got donkeys. He is becoming a very blessed man. In the Hebrew, it says exceedingly prosperous. Or you could even say that the Hebrew says uh, that it burst out exceedingly, exceedingly. Okay, wow. That's kind of like our saying exceedingly above all that we could think or ask. That's how he was being blessed. Ma'od, ma'od are the words in the Hebrew, and he has large flocks. So, Yaakov put it into God's hands, and God is blessing him. Remember, this happened when he was taking care of all of Levon's flocks. When he started with Levon, Laban, Laban had very little. By the time we got 14 years down the line, Laban had large flocks, enough to separate and do all that we're reading about at this point. So he is being very blessed. God is blessing, just as was said before. Levani caught that. Where you are, the blessing is. Yaakov caught it. Where my foot turns, God has blessed me. We know that God was leading his foot and guiding him. So even in this, where he's starting with nothing, where all odds were against him, where Levon should have had the favor, we see it going to Jacob. We see Yaakov, his flocks being what's blessed. When we get into chapter 31, we'll read verses 9 through 12 at that time. It's talking about the heredity and the, the streaking and the spotted and all that were to be born. But what we see is that the fact that everything was against them and they were having more of those was because of God's hand. It wasn't the natural. It was against nature. In verse 31 verse 12, let's just peek real quick at, at that one. Um, for a moment because that one I think sums it up and like I say we'll read all these verses very soon maybe even in class today if not definitely next week but verse 12 says 
He said, lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats which are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. God speaking to Yaakov in a dream, we know that from verse 9, and what God is saying is, look, all the offspring are turning out to be speckled, spotted, uh, whatever the other word is. All of them are, because I've seen Levon take advantage of you, I've seen he's against you, so I'm taking care of you. Yaakov knew it was God who was doing it. So his flock is exceeding. Uh, Laban's is not. He has some, excuse me, but it's not exceedingly, uh, exceedingly like Jacob's is. And it's because the hand of God is saying, I see Laban evil against you and I'm taking care of you. So uh, in the space of about four or five years, Yaakov's flocks have grown so large that he's added on all of these servants and, and animals that I have said, and it was all done in the right way. He didn't manipulate. He, he knew good breeding practices. He did it by normal standards. He did it for Levon's flocks as well as for his own. You know, what more can I say? That Levon should realize he was still benefiting, but it certainly was not because Levon was being cheated by Yaakov. Did Levon cheat Yaakov? Absolutely. Take advantage of him? Absolutely. But Yaakov does not turn around and do the same thing back. Keep that in mind when you hear everybody slander his character and call him a deceiver and etc. etc. Notice the character that we're seeing of this man here, how he was taking care of Laban at his expense and it was God who brought him the blessing instead. So we go into verse, I'm sorry, into chapter 31, and we go into 31 with um, Jacob, very wealthy, um, being very blessed. Things are good. You think it'll stay there? <laughs> what happens when somebody's getting really blessed by God? They forget about God. <laughs> well, yeah, that can happen with a person and so that they forget about God, and unfortunately all too true, but that isn't what's going to happen here. What's going to happen here is jealousy. Those who are not getting as blessed are going to get very jealous. So let's see what happens. Chapter 31, verse 1. When, now, Yaakov heard the words of Levon's sons. Remember, they were set in charge of that. All those that, that God had blessed, that they were the speckled, spotted, all that. They were taking care of them. And they had the same opportunity to work with their herds and with their, you know, with all that was going on, but they're not being as blessed. So they see that. They see Jacob has more. <coughs> and notice what they say. Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father, he has made all this wealth. Okay. When did Jacob take it away from Levon? Remember, he started with nothing. All he got was the offspring that would be the less desired. But he didn't take anything. It was not that he had done anything wrong. So he wasn't making his wealth off of Levon's back. I'll put it that way. But that's how the sons are saying it. Basically, what they're seeing is their inheritance is slipping away. When Yaakov was working for their father and the whole house was being blessed, that would be their inheritance. They were thinking, good, you know, this is good, this is for us also. But remember, Levon didn't have much before Yaakov came in. So what the sons were enjoying was the blessing of God because of Yaakov. And Levon now is probably getting pretty old. You know, we know they're all aging more. Levon wasn't that young earlier. And the sons are becoming bitter. And they're accusing Jacob of thievery. They're envious of his wealth. And they see that it's greater proportion. And they see that what their dad's going to have to turn over to them is not desirous. They want what Jacob has. So Yaakov, Jacob's pretty smart. You can tell when people are not real happy with you. In verse 2 it says, He saw the attitude of Levon, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. Now notice it didn't say he saw the attitude of Levon's sons. So probably the sons were going and griping and complaining to Levon, 
and he was realizing himself what I had. I, I had my peak. Now I'm diminishing. This isn't as good. And they probably griped back and forth to each other, fed each other's envy and uh, wrong attitude. Um, and so we see that, that Laban is not friendly toward Jacob like he was before. Now remember initially, he, oh come, stay with me. He's hoping to get riches, you know, like um, Isaac's family gave to get Rebecca, Laban's sister, you know, so he was probably looking for that. He probably did treat Jacob, you know, with favor um, when he's courting for his wife, you know, when he wanted Laban's daughter. But now there's nothing Laban is able to hold over Jacob to say, hey, come my way and get, and he's not happy now. And so his whole face, his whole attitude is changing toward Yaakov. And usually a person's face, their expressions, their voice tones, you can tell that someone's not happy with you. And very quickly, this is hitting a breaking point where there's going to be some sort of an explosion. So no doubt the sons are feeding Laban's anger, Laban's feeding their anger, and uh, it's not as comfortable as it used to be. They, they don't have a good relationship going here. So it could be this is what helped kind of stir in Yaakov's heart that maybe it's time to leave. You know, this isn't his home. He came to get a wife. He's got a wife. He's got two. <laughs> but he also probably was smart enough to know when I want to leave, it's going to be a battle to leave with what's mine. Because Levon's not going to play fair. He's not going to want to let me take my family and my flocks. He's going to cause grief. But God knowing all things also, God does intervene. And we're going to see the hand of the Lord intervene. So, let's get to that. Verse 3, the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Okay, the Lord, in our Hebrew it says, Jehovah said. Who is Jehovah? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just stepped on a flock. This flock happens to be dog nature instead of sheep. But I didn't know she was at my feet. Sorry, folks. <laughs> She's not a sheep dog, but she fits <laughs> in there somewhere. Anyway, sorry, Shadow. <laughs> anyway, okay, so Jehovah speaking to Yaakov. Remember when we see the names of God, we look at which name is being used because it tells the different attributes of our God. Jehovah is the name of the covenant-keeping God. So God's made covenant with Avraham. God made covenant with Yitzhak. God made covenant with Yaakov. We talked about it when we talked about chapter 28, verses 4, and I think it's 15. Prior to his coming, we know that he knows that promise of the inheritance of the land of Canaan, the land that we call Israel, that that was to be Yaakov's inheritance. And that's the God who's reminding him, I'm the God who has entered into a relationship with you, made a covenant with you, and so this is the God who is talking to him. And at this point when the Lord speaks to him, it's like the third principle of discerning the will of God. First there was the desire. Okay, chapter 30 and verse 25 where we picked up. Remember, Yaakov was saying, hey, I've paid my price. I've done my duty. Let's go home. So the desire was there. That desire probably was, was laying kind of um, under the surface for the next six years. During that time, Levon and the sons start being less favorable toward Yaakov. He realizes we're hitting a point of no return. We're really clashing. Hmm. So along with desire, circumstances are kind of stirring that desire up all the more. We see that in, in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter. And then verse 3, that third layer is the word of God. Whether it was written, whether it's spoken to the heart. For us, we can have it either way. God can speak to us in our desire, put a desire in us for what he wants us to do put circumstances in our path to encourage us to do that, and then can either speak directly to our heart or can even through the written word speak to us. And for Yaakov, it was through uh, his spoken voice. I fully believe God gave Yaakov the desire to go home. Then he allowed the circumstances to become uncomfortable, unbearable. 
And then thirdly, he gave personal direction to Yaakov. And Yaakov hearing the voice of the Lord, and if we're in tune, we hear the voice of the Lord, we're going to be quick and obedient to follow if we want to stay within that blessing. I'm not holding myself up as an example equal to this at all. I'm just saying, does God work in this way in our lives in this day and age? Absolutely. I had lived a number of years in an apartment building, had been very happy. Circumstances started changing and the thought came into my mind for the first time, hmm, I wonder if I need to think about moving. And to make the long story short, 30 days from that thought to setting foot in what would become my home. God was at work. I wouldn't have been looking, I wouldn't have found, I wouldn't have moved into the home he had planned for me had he not allowed circumstances to be a little less favorable and then put the desire of my heart Now's the time to get a home. God does work in the same way. Again, am I equal to this level? I'm not saying that, but can we hear the voice of God? Can we look at scripture and apply it? Absolutely. And I want to encourage you to do so. So, Jacob's got the voice of the Lord telling him, and we're going to see he acts on it, okay? And I don't know if I read all the verse. I want to read all of it. Verse 3, that the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers, go back to Canaan, go back to your relatives, and I will be with you. Don't miss that. Remember he told him he would go with him, and now he's telling him, I'll take you back home. So, Jacob knows what he's supposed to do. And in verse 4, he sent and he called Rachel and Leah, his wives, to his flock in the field. Okay, so he's out in the field taking care of the, the sheep and goats. And he calls Price and his servants, told him, go tell my wives to come out here and talk to me. Now, why is he doing it out in the field? So nobody would hear. Very good. <laughs> You're with the story. Very likely, he knows what he's about to propose is not going to be favorable by the others around him. He's got to know if his wives are on the same page with him. If they're not, he's going to have a lot of trouble, but he's got to know where they're at. And being a good husband, he's bringing his wives into the equation because this is a major change. This is a major move. And so he wants them to be able to talk freely from their hearts also. If they knew they were going to be overheard and reported back to their dad, <laughs> they're not going to speak freely either. But he wants to know, are they willing to go with him? So he brings that up to them. He calls them to the field and he says to them in verse 5, I see your father's attitude that it's not friendly toward me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. I know your dad's not with me, but I know the God of my father. He is with me. You know that I've served your father with all my strength, with all my power. That tells us how he served Lavan. And actually the word bondservant, we see it when bondservant is used. And in other words, it shows the extent of his dedication. He acted like a true 100% servant bonded to his master. Remember, a bond servant had had a chance to go free, but had chosen to stay and serve his master and to serve out his, excuse me, his time with him. So Jacob didn't hold back. He didn't partially help Levon. He fully helped him. He poured his heart and soul and everything he had into working for Levon the whole time he was there. Not just for Rachel, but continued on with the taking care of the flocks also. This is going to come back up by the time we get to the end of the chapter too. So I am laying it down here for you to know it and see, you know, he, he did all that he could and all that he should. No half-heartedness within him. Verse 7. Yet your father has cheated me, changed my wages ten times. However, <clears throat> I lost my place. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. Okay, God didn't allow him to do any financial harm to, to Yaakov. Yaakov continued to prosper no matter what, even though the Hebrew says that their father, um, um, I'll just, their father, let me just say it that way. Even though he dealt deceitfully, and he was a very deceitful, grasping man, we see that in his character all the way through, from way back with Rebecca to now, 
10 times he changed Yaakov's wages. Now, there are two ways that can be taken. One, in scripture, sometimes we see it as just speaking like a round number. It's meaning like, you know, so many times we can't even count. It's commonly used that way. Let me show you a couple of examples. And if you don't want to look up the verses, I'll read them to you. They are down in your cross-references. The first I'm going to go to is Leviticus Viacra, Leviticus 26 and verse 26. And in that verse we read, When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. So they used a round number of 10 women are going to come against your one oven of bread, and they're going to steal it for themselves. Numbers, Bamidbar, Book of Numbers, Chapter 14. Numbers 14, and we're going to look at verse 22 in Chapter 14 of the Book of Bamidbar, of the Book of Numbers. Certainly all the people have seen my glory and my signs which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness yet have put me to the test these ten times, and have not listened to my voice. God saying ten times the children of Israel came against me. They didn't trust me, even though I was faithful to them. Um, some other examples, let me give you one more, and then I'll give you the references. First Samuel 1 and verse 8. Uh, yeah, First Samuel 1 and verse 8. Um, now, it might have been literally ten times that the children of Israel came against God. It might have been just saying repeatedly. In chapter 1, uh, first Shmuel, Samuel, then Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, Hannah for you, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Hannah was wanting a baby. She was wanting a son so badly, she was going up to the temple every year praying to the God of Israel to give her a son. And her husband, feeling so bad for her, says you know, he would give her everything he could. He provided beautifully for her, and he just, just you know, like today somebody would just give him gift after gift and express love and do all they could for them to make them feel better. And he was saying, aren't I better than 10 sons? Now, he didn't mean literally count them, here's 10 sons, but the idea is even if you had 10 sons, they couldn't do as much for you as I'm doing for you because my love for you is greater than theirs. So other examples are Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 12 and Eov, Job chapter 19 and verse 3. But keeping that in mind that it can be just an expression, I'm going to point out to you can also be exacting. When we go back into Genesis 31, we're going to see that it's repeated. Come on. And we're going to see that I'm talking to my tablet <laughs> for sake of the video. We're going to see that it's repeated down in verse 41 also. Verse 41, Yaakov is speaking and he says, These 20 years I've been in your house. I've served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. And he's calling Levon out on the carpet. I don't think it's a time when he would use exaggeration or roundness because Levon could jump on that and say, no, I didn't. So I think it's telling us it was literally 10 times that Levon changed his wages. As we go through the story, we know that when the speckled were becoming more in number, then Levon would change it and say, the speckled are mine and you get the black. And when the black would grow in number, then he'd change it and say, you, I get the black and you get the spotted. He just kept changing, changing, changing. Whatever he said was Jacob's, God made that to bless. And we know it was God doing it. We saw that in verse 12 earlier in the whole thing, 9 to 12, verses 9 to 12 in chapter 31 explain that. So back up here when he's saying to the girls, to his wives, that, uh, um, you know, your dad's cheated me ten times, he's changed the wages. It probably was exactly ten times. And what's very interesting is Mesopotamia, the area that, that they're living in, it brought forth young twice a year. They, the common time for babies to be born, it was cycled twice a year, okay, very often. 
for us, we talk about springtime brings the new birth. They had two times that were very common in the year, for, for sheep anyway. I don't know about everything else, but for sheep. So, ten times would speak to five years. He's in the sixth year with them now. It seems like every time when, when the babies were being born, Lavon changed the wages every single time. And I think that's what we're being told, that there wasn't once that Lavon stuck with it. He kept switching, trying to catch up and get to the one that was producing the best. But God ran ahead of him and kept blessing Yaakov with whatever was supposed to be his. So that's what we're saying here, how, how God did not allow it to hurt Yaakov. Levon changed the roles and God changed the circumstances. Levon changed the roles and God changed, again, the offspring that would be born. And it continued on 10 different times. You would think Levon would wake up and realize, hey, I can't win this battle, but he never does. Um, and verse 8, Jacob saying, if he spoke thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flock brought forth speckled. And if he spoke thus, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock brought forth striped. Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. God's the one that did it. God's the one that made them be born, however they were to be born. And Yaakov's very clear to say, hey, it's not me. I didn't do it. I'm not telling you that you prosper, that I prospered at my own hand or my being clever, or my knowing secret ways to do it, he gives God full credit. God protected him, God prospered him, and he gives God all the credit. Verse 10, um, I did nine, right? Yeah, thus God had taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. And it came about at the time when the flock were mating that I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream. Okay, so I think this was initially in the beginning when Levon had made those rules, how it was going to be. And remember, Jacob was to get only the spotted, speckled, and, and um, I keep forgetting the third, the, le the lesser, anyway. Um, here's what was happening. God showed Yaakov, and it came in a dream. Um, and I'm looking for that. Okay, I saw in a dream, in the middle of verse 10. Uh, when they were mating, I saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and mottled. Now, very honestly, we all know the truth of this. You can see two animals mate. Can you tell what that offspring will be like? No. You, you have no control over it. You can't make them come out with a certain whatever. You can see the chances of what they'll be. But you can't make them. And we know that there's recessive genes, so that some come out with something that was genetically in their line, but not in their parents. So God showing Jacob in the dream, basically, remember he started with just the solid color. So he's seeing two, let's call them black goats, mate, but God showed him the offspring is going to be speckled. The offspring is going to be striped. The offspring is not going to come out black. God showed him that in the dream. Um, verse 11, and there's my other word, modeled. Striped, <coughs> speckled, and modeled, okay? And again, it's just all of those <coughs> off breeds. We'll put it that way. Verse 11, then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Yaakov. And I said, and if you know the Hebrew word, Hineni. We, we know that word from other times in the scripture. So Jacob saying to God, I hear you. Here I am. I'm reporting to you. <coughs> God said, verse 12, he said, lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats which are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Levon has been doing to you. So right from the get-go, right from the time that they separated, that Levon took the speckled and all that, gave them to his sons. He kept the, the solid colors. Yaakov was to only work with the solid colors and only get the offspring that would not be solid. Right in the beginning, God said, I see what Levon's done to you for 14 years. I see how he's taken advantage and I see how he's trying to now. And I'm going to give you all the offspring. They're all going to be. And that's why Levon had to come along and change it because all of a sudden when he said all the black are mine, now there's no little black babies being born. They're only spotted, speckled, and modeled. 
So the dream is showing very clearly that God was blessing Jacob. Now later we get blessed some too because they're still part of his flock, but the what would go to Jacob was not. So notice how it says that the angel of God in verse 11, that's who was speaking to him. Who does Yaakov know as the angel of God, the Malach of Elohim? We can go all the way back, and actually we don't have to, we can look forward. Let's just cheat and look at verse 13 real quick. Because he goes on and identifies himself, God speaking. The angel of God said to me in verse 11, and verse 13, he says, I am the God of Baal. I am the God of Bethel. Okay, that takes us back to chapter 28. That takes us back to the ladder. Remember, they call it Jacob's ladder, but I asked you, whose ladder is it anyway? <laughs> I don't believe it's Jacob's ladder, and, and I brought that out for you before. I think I have some points to bring out to you here. Um, let me just remind you, uh, maybe I didn't bring my notes with me, but let me remind you, when he saw that ladder, Jehovah was standing at the top of the ladder. Remember, it's Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God that's speaking to Jacob. Jehovah showed him uh, in that ladder the ascending and the descending of the messengers, the angels from God, but we see ultimately that the ladder represented the Son of God who the angels were descending and ascending on. They were servants to the one true and living God who was coming in the flesh. Yochanan John 1 ties it in, verse 51 of Yochanan of John chapter 1 tells us that that ladder was a picture of Messiah, that that's what we were seeing was the promise of Messiah. All of this in this name, all of this that he's being reminded when Yaakov woke up from that dream where he saw, where he thinks he's on his own and going out of the land of promise and God is showing him, I'm the promise, I'm going with you, I'm the one bridging earth to heaven for you by my very blood, I'm the one that's going to bring you into all the blessings, I'm the one that's going to give you salvation, I am your God, all of that. When Yaakov woke up from that dream at Beit El, he called the place, it used to be called Lutz. He changed it to Beit El, Bethel, because that means house of God. And he said, I didn't realize it when I went to sleep here, but this is the very house of God. God is right here. And he took the, the stone that he had used for his pillow and he made an altar out of it and said, this is the very gateway to heaven. And he was right. God had opened up heaven, poured heaven down to earth to show Yaakov how he would ascend into heaven through the Messiah. All of this in his mind. So when he's being reminded here, with that the angel of God speaking to him, I think he recognized in his dream, this is the one who spoke to me at Beit El. He's now speaking to me again. This is the one who made covenant with me. This is the one who has promised these blessings. This is the one who is faithful. I could go on and on because I, I've got to stop there and give you a whole lesson on Jacob's ladder and the name of God. But it's very clear that the angel of God said to Yaakov, now this is what's going to happen. It's the angel of God taking care of him. You're going to have the, the offspring. They're going to be yours. Verse, I think, yeah, I did read verse 12. Verse 13, I am. Even that, it's not the great I am, but in our minds we can hear that I am, and it is the great I am. I just mean he doesn't stop there with that being the title here. I am the God of Baal. I'm the God of Bethel. I'm the God where you anointed a pillar. I just told you about it. Where you made a vow to me. And that vow was, God, if you take me safely and you bring me back safely, I will give you a tenth of all you give to me. I'll be obedient to you. I'll follow you. Yaakov making covenant with God. Okay, so he's being reminded of that, where that started now. Arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. Remember you covenanted with me. If I take you out and I bring you back, I'm your God, and you will give blessing to me out of the abundance that I give to you. And Yaakov is right on board with that. Okay, he has no problem. He is ready to go home. So he's presented it to the girls. I need to go home, the God of... of the, the God of Bethel, the angel of the Lord, the angel of God has appeared to me. He has shown me in a dream what's going on. He has spoken to me that it's time for me to return home. And he basically asks the girls, are you willing? Will you go with me? Um, and by the way, when we look at types in scripture, we can see the way that God took care of Yaakov in adversity 
is the way that God has prospered the Jewish people throughout the dispersion all the way through down to today. The Jew would not survive, would it not be that God has been unconditionally keeping his hand upon Israel. And that's true all the way down to 2024 today. But because God is faithful and God keeps his promise, they have survived. God was faithful to Yaakov, blessed him in the land where the ones in the land were not in favor toward them and wanted to do evil toward him. But God reminds Yaakov of his vow. God's fulfilled his. He's kept him. He's blessed him. He's given him the wives and, and all that's coming with it now. And now it's time to go back to keep the rest of his promise and return to the <laughs> land. I find it very interesting also that the place that Yaakov anointed the pillar that he anointed was at Baal. It was not in Padan Aram. Even though he saw God take him there safely and bless him there, Jacob, when he was out of the land, never built an altar. Not that we read of anyway. And that's to us a picture of Israel dispersed out in the, the foreign lands without the, the temple, without the altar outside of the land. She needs to get back into the land. Physically, she has started, but she needs to get back in the land spiritually and have her altar, which would be the, the new temple that Messiah will sit on in the millennial time, ruling and reigning, and she will see and receive her blessings because God is faithful and keeps his covenant. So a beautiful picture there for us. He's ready. I think I've explain everything I need to. I hope I haven't skipped anything. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, Rachel and Leah need to answer him in verse 14. Here's their answer. Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Everything that should be theirs has gone to their brothers, to, to the uh, herds that they're keeping. Levon's not given anything to them. They see that. What have we got here? Verse 15, they go on. Are we not reckoned by him as foreigners? For he sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Okay, those are hard words for us to understand if we don't know the Eastern culture and the ways that, uh, that marriages and things took place then. Let me explain first when it says uh, regarded or you may have um, counted in another reckon. Um, the way that Levon has treated them, I'll put it that way, the way their own father has treated them is if they were foreigners, not that they were family. And the way that he sold them, you work for me for seven years and you get your wife. Now you work for me for seven more years to get the wife you thought you were going to get. And Yaakov gave something to them, which is what a bridegroom did. That's this purchase price. I'll explain it in a moment. But even that purchase price, the girls are saying, even that's gone. Even, and even our father has taken what should have been ours by virtue of this marriage relationship we entered into, that dowry, as it's sometimes called, that, that even our father has stolen our dowry. They had lost all respect for their dad. He had done nothing for him. He had not acted like a father to him. He had acted like they were foreigners, and he had not done anything for them. Now, in this time, in the, the original covenant times that we're dealing with in the Bible times, the bridegroom often would give a gift to the bride. Now, you have to know that he, he, the bridegroom and the bride, often it was an arranged marriage, and I'm talking about when they were old enough, not when it was children that they were arranging, but when it was old enough, the bridegroom would give a gift to that bride the marriage wouldn't be consummated for probably a year or better when it was decided on and they entered into contract and the bridegroom went back to his father's house. He built on a place for his bride. When the father would say everything's ready, then the, the groom would go get his bride. But it kind of was like, maybe you could call it a down payment, a good faith move, whatever. The bridegroom would give something to the bride to show, I, I mean business, I'm coming back for you, here, let this tide you over in the meantime, and bless her in some way. There would often be blessing given in that way to the family also, because they were going to be taking a worker, a helper in the household, away from that family. So often they would give to the, um, to the parents of the 
the bride spoken for also, but there would be something that was given. And if they had something tangible they could give, they would give a tangible gift, a hands-on, here's your gift. Uh, bless them, maybe it was with sheep, maybe it was, you know, whatever it was. But in a case like Yaakov, who's come from his home with nothing, he had nothing to give, but he had something to give. He had his labor to give. And he could give a dowry of his service as a servant for the bride. So basically, he bought his bride. And he bought Rachel by 14 years because he, he had worked seven more than expected. But that's why he was even willing to enter into that type of covenant. I don't have something I can bless her with, go back home, build the place, and come and get her and bring her. I am going to bring her to my home. I am going to return to my home. But I can pledge me in the meantime. I can give her my service because Yaakov could have gone and worked for some other shepherd in the area and received wages and could have given a monetary gift. But instead, he worked for Laban for nothing. So that the money that Laban would have had to expend on a servant as the flocks increase, it saved Laban all of that money. So that should have gone to Rachel and to Leah, not just to Laban. It shouldn't have been just for Laban's house. It should have been that, that the money that would have gone for all the service that Jacob gave should have been the girl's. And it should have been theirs when they leave that home. But Laban had spent it. Laban didn't have it to give, or if he did, he wasn't going to let go of it anyway. And the girls are very sure of that. That, you know, even if, when we look at what you came to us and gave, you gave all that service for in exchange for us, that even should be ours, and that's all been consumed. Our fathers consumed everything so that we literally will leave his household with nothing. The only thing that we'll have is what belongs to our husband, to Jacob, because the flock is his. So they're basically saying, Dad didn't do right by us. There's nothing here. We see his attitude toward our husband is not good. We know that it's going to only get worse. There's nothing here to hold us back. We're, we're basically, we're ready to go. We, We'll go with you. So, um, and, and then verse 16, I don't think I've read that yet. I just finished consuming our purchase price. That's the money that should have been paid Jacob for being a servant. Verse 16, surely all the wealth which God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. Okay, so all that should have come to us should have gone down to our children. It should have been in our household to bless our household, to bless our children. All of that now that, that should have been, it's gone. So do whatever God's put in your heart to do, Jacob. That's what we're going to do also. So they're, they're ready. There's nothing that's holding them back. Jacob is not tearing two girls from their own home and, and breaking their hearts. No, no. And I'm sure he talked to them all along about how he was going to return to the land of Canaan, that he would be taking them back home with him. They knew it, I'm sure, before marriage even took place because he was working for them seven years before uh, they ever had the marriage, so they would have had time to talk and know what was in his heart and what he was like. So, family's in agreement. Jacob, his wives, they're all in agreement. So verse 17, Jacob arose, put his children, he might have his sons, they were, they were, most, they were sons that, that we know about, the 11 sons, but same word uh, in the Hebrew, and his wives upon camels. He's got enough camels, the, the kids and the wives are going to get to ride. They're not going to have to walk it all the way back home. But he's, he's got them. And he drove away all of his livestock and all his property which he had gathered. His acquired livestock which he had gathered in Padan Aram to go to the land of Canaan to his father Yitzhak, his father Isaac. So he took all his cattle, if you've got the word cattle, his flocks, his sheep and his goats, all the movable property, that's everything that belonged to him, the servants he had, had brought on the camels, the donkeys, everything that he's been blessed with, and we're going to see in chapter 32, they are his. I'll just 
tell you, you can read ahead verses 3 and 5 if you want. But all this he's acquired. It's all what he has, has been blessed with in these years that Levon's tried to cheat him out of his wages. So everything that he has is now to go with him to Canaan, to his father's home. When he brings up the name of Isaac here, he probably even was thinking, remember if he was about 90 when he came, he's about 110 now. That puts his father up there 20 more years in age too. And as the birthright son, and we know that he cared about the birthright, not just the blessings of it, he knows his responsibility is to be there for his father, to take care of his father in his last days, to take care of his father's household, to be the spiritual leader of his father's household, that it continue on uh, pleasing God and being in order with what God uh, is establishing what God is directing. So knowing all that, that's probably been weighing on him. I don't think he had any intent when he left. Remember, he left because he was fleeing uh, his brother Esau who wanted to kill him. But I don't think he had any idea or any intention to be gone for 20 years. That's a long time to be gone. And I think it's been tugging at his heart, God putting it in his heart, and he's saying, hey, I have a responsibility to my father. I don't have a responsibility to Levon to take care of Levon to the end of his life. That's his son's responsibility. You wives don't have that responsibility either. You're my wives. It's time to go back home. So there is great responsibility that, that came with that birthright. Blessing also, privileges also. But he's, he's acknowledging it and he's ready. And so he's, the girl said they'll go. He puts them on the camels and all that belongs to them, and they're headed for his father's house. Verse 19. Does the plot thicken, or does everything go wonderful, and, and we have them back home? <laughs> well, verse 19, when Levon had gone to share his flock, he had gone off. Remember, he had his flocks out three days with his sons and, and his own. When he had gone to share his flock, then Rachel, Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's. Have I told you everything? Did I skip? No, I'm right there. I haven't skipped it. Okay. Um, this would be a good time for Yaakov to leave. If he knows that Levon's going to give him grief, it's not going to be a pretty picture, then why take that on? When he's gone, he's going to be gone for a while. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Good time to take off. Excuse me. So continue that's what week. he's been. So continue next week. <laughs> continue next week. Not quite. We got a little more class. <laughs> so um, he he's probably thinking in his own mind, and he would have been a hundred percent right. Would Levon let him leave with his daughters, with the livestock, with the grandchildren? You know, leave Levon with only what belongs to Levon? No way. He's not going to be content with that. So he's ready. Let's get out of here. Let's go now. Rachel takes the household gods, the images or gods or idols, whatever words you have there. The Hebrew says teraphim or that oracle, that word to inquire. So again, these were the gods that they used to inquire, to uh, divinate, to try to, to um, get you know, what, what should be done. Some believe that it would be to bring good luck. Some believed it was only to gain information. Let me show you that Israel mixed this kind of apostasy into the belief in the one true and living God, often in their history. We're going to go to some other verses. So again, if you don't want to look them up, they're in your cross-references, and uh, I'll read what I do and tell you the rest at the end. Judges, chapter 17. We'll start with verse 5, and then we'll drop down to 12 and 13. Judges chapter 17, verse 5 says, And the man Micha, Micah had a shrine and a maiden ephod and household idols and consecrated one of the sons so that he <coughs> might become his priest. All of this is a copy, it's counterfeit. We know that God had established the tabernacle, the movable temple before it was a temple. Remember, the tabernacle could be moved through the wilderness. Um, but here we've got that um, um, he's made a shrine, 
He's made an ephod, that's the breastplate of the what the high priest would wear. He's made a copy of that. He's got, excuse me, his household gods. And he's even taken one of his sons and declared that this son is a priest. Now, where do we see that allowed in scripture? Nowhere, nowhere. The priest came out of the tribe of, of Levi. They were appointed by God. Not every Levi was a priest, but every priest was a Levi, okay? Nowhere could we have these kind of substitutes. Nowhere were they allowed to make a fake facsimile and say, oh, here's an ephod, here's a priest, here's an altar, here's a temple or a tabernacle, and we'll, we'll get from God what we need. But that's what he did in, in verse 5. Verses 12 and 13 says, Micha consecrated the Levite, so he did at least get himself a Levite. The young man became his priest, but remember not every Levite was a priest. They had to be appointed by God. So he did at least get a Levite to be his, quote, priest. And I lost my place. I'm good at that today. Okay. And he lived in the house of Micha. Then Micha said, now I know the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. He's gone and done it all his own, on his own way and said, now I got it. I got a priest. I got a priest living in my house. I'm going to be so blessed. How foolish can you be? Okay. Go to chapter 18. Just one more chapter, same book, Judges, chapter 18. There we go. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 6. When they were near the house of Micha, we're following the story, they recognized the voice of the young man, the Levite. They turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? And what are you doing in this place? And what do you have here? He, the, the fake priest, said to them, Micha has done this and that for me, and he's hired me, and I've become his priest. Then they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether our way on which we're going will be successful. And the priest, in verse 6, said to them, Go in peace in the way in which you're going with the Lord's approval. So they, uh, did this, these people that come to Micah's house, they're looking, they want to know that they're going to be uh, victorious, and they're willing to ask this one who has set up himself, his son as a priest, and made all this false they're, they're saying, oh, well, we'll encounter you. Let us know. Are we going to be blessed? They didn't go to the one true and living God. They went to this knockoff. They were mixing it instead of staying true. The same way that, that later you have the Samaritans made a place of worship because it was too far to go down to Jerusalem. God didn't give room for that. He told them they were to go to Jerusalem. They were go to go to the temple. They were to worship there. Well, they made their place and said, oh, we can worship our God here. And of course, um, among that brought in idolatry and false worship. And that's why the Samaritans, even in the Jews, were butting heads centuries later, really, was because the one despised the other because of the idolatry that was mixed in. So you can't just, oh, I'll copy God. It has to be God-ordained, but that's what they were doing. And they were using priests, idols, divinations to get what they would assume was God's will and God's way. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 21, we see this again. It wasn't, it's, it's repeated through Israel's history, sadly. Chapter 21, verse 21 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel we have for the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways to use divination. He shakes the arrows. He consults the household idols. He looks at the liver. Now, I'm not going to try to explain looking at the liver, but <laughs> they have these different omens and things that they would, you know, discern and deal with and say, oh, okay, this is, you know, this is what God's telling us to do. Nowhere do we read that they're looking to the one true and living God. They're mixing it. They're, they, we believe in the God of Israel, but we're using these other means to find out the way. Lastly, look at Zechariah, Zechariah uh, chapter 10. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 2. And in 10 verse 2 we read again, For the household idols speak deception. The diviners see an illusion. They tell deceitful dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore the people wander like sheep and they are wretched because there is no shepherd. They've set up a false sense of security. They've mixed it in. They're looking to it. And any time they did, good did not come from it. Now, it's very interesting. If you know Israel's history at all, 
You know the story of Balaam, you know the story of Balak that, that wanted Balaam to curse Israel. You know, all of that that goes on. You've got the, the well, I don't want to get you sidetracked. Let me just say that much. Balaam was very well known as one who would, could discern what God was saying. But he did it in his own power. He was not anointed by God. He was not speaking for God. And it is believed, and I can't prove it, no one can, but it is believed that Balaam was a descendant of, Le of Levon, of Laban. Um, some believe it was even his grandson. So just interesting. He definitely came from the same area. He would have been one that dealt with the household gods and with diviners and so forth instead of the one true and living God. But it is interesting, and why I bring it out here is it is believed that he was one of Laban's own flesh and blood. Is, is uh, that Balaam you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay. Balaam, Balaam, yes. Okay. Is it yes. in the Bible? Uh, Balaam, yes, yes. And how he, what he's supposed to do, Balak wants to curse the children of Israel so that he can win and they lose, and he hires Balaam, Balaam, yeah, Balaam, Balaam. He hires him to curse Israel. And he does tell Balak, Balak, oh, wow. he does tell him, I can only speak what God lets me speak. Mm -hmm. So when he opens his mouth to curse, he blesses. And Balak gets mad at him, and, and three times this happens, and the blessing is all that ever comes out. But then he sadly does say, but I can tell you, I can't curse them because God won't let me, but I can tell you how to trip them up. Send in the, the daughters of Moab. Send in those who are in idolatry. They'll turn the, the heads of the men. They'll mix, and you, it'll wear them down. And that's true to this day. How often, often, how a person gets tripped up is through a relationship of one who is not on the same page, worshiping only the one true and living God. That's why God says, don't be unequally yoked. And I will say that goes across from marriage to business to anything where you're making decisions. You need to have a like-minded who looks at God only, not at anything else. If you want God's blessing in there, want to know really what God's will and way is. So um, Balaam was, uh, Laban had a son named Baor. They believe that Baor was the father of this and he was called a prophet, but he was a false prophet, obviously, Balaam. Um, I should have looked up the reference for you. I know it's in numbers. I'll look up the reference and bring it back next week, and we'll try to append to this and put it on this video. If I forget to listen next week, and you'll get it too. Um, it, but it's also interesting, just as a side note, Levon Laban was trying to enslave Jacob. He wanted to keep Jacob there for his own good, but he wanted to keep Jacob there. If Jacob had stayed, not kept his promise, not gone back home, God promised you know, to take care of him, but if he had stayed there, the Jewish people would have become slaves in that area because Jacob was a slave. So his sons would have been slaves, and it would go on, and it would go on, and they would be slaves to the people of Aram, the area that they were in. That's very much like what happened with Pharaoh in Egypt. We see another attempt of Satan to wipe out the Jewish population. Yaakov needed to adhere to the voice of God, even for the progeny of his family to continue on. Um, but this is another attempt of Satan trying to detract, get off track, the, the Jewish people from what is their promises of God. Um, spiritually, we know that there's a hatred of Levon toward Yaakov. Okay, I'm taking it into the spiritual. And in that hatred, we have the attempt to eradicate the Jewish nation. We've seen this from the very beginning, but we see it even today. And when the question is asked today, why are the Jewish people so hated? What have they done that makes this world so hate them right now? Why are the kids on the campuses hating their Jewish fellow students? Why is there such a, a thrust against Israel? <clears throat> only, um, what's she doing? She, she's trying to secure herself, only defend. Why is, is the world going against Israel defending? 
Israel didn't buy this war. Israel didn't bring it on. Israel didn't decide to go and attack another people. Israel was attacked in her own land, literally in her own bedroom, asleep in bed and attacked, literally. Why this hatred? What have they done? And the answer is there is nothing that they have done. This is Satan's hatred toward God and his plan. Satan wants that place of authority. He wants it to be his plan and he wants to receive the worship. To get that, he has to knock out Messiah. He has to knock out Israel and God's plan with Israel. If Levon had succeeded, Israel would have assimilated and would have disappeared from history and God's redemptive plan of history would not have been able to be performed because it had to come through the line, through the Jewish line. The promised seed had to come from Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and on down that same line. So even God sending Yaakov home was for the preservation of the people of Israel so the promise of Messiah could still be fulfilled. And here we just see literally an attempt by God, I'm sorry, by Satan to overrule God. And Yaakov, by God's grace, overcomes Levon and returns to the promised land. And we're going to see he returns with blessing. And we know God always rules. God always wins. Satan cannot change the future. I would say give up, Satan, but why is he going to listen to me? <laughs> you know, but we just, we just know this is ridiculous. What, how, the audacity, the pride that he has, that he thinks he can come up in the face of God and destroy God's eternal plan. I don't get it. Sorry, folks. I don't get it. I'll get off my sandbox. Oh, my goodness, I will because I'm past time. I'm supposed to be coming to a closing here. Um, let, me, let me finish this about the idols, the mixing of the idols um, with the true religion, too. Excavations that have taken place in northern Mesopotamia, Padan Aram, that area and around there, they show, and somehow they know, you know, I don't know how to read and understand all that archaeology under, uncovers, but they've uncovered these household gods, and they know, like they call them the Hammurabi rule of law that was in effect in those days, and one of the rules that was given was these household gods, if a father-in-law gave those household gods to the son-in-law, it was legally accepted as proof that that son-in-law was now the principal heir rather than sons if there were sons maybe maybe the, he only had daughters however it was that son-in-law became more like a son and would get the inheritance of the father-in-law if he had hold of those gods it was almost like that's the title deed to what they possessed so why did Rachel, why did Rachel take the gods? Some say she took them because she wanted to be able to divine. She wanted to be able to get inside information. I don't believe that. I don't see her. In fact, we know that when she finally confesses that she's got them, she doesn't fight Jacob over burying them. That's what they do with them. They get rid of them. I don't see her say, oh, we need these. I think that she could have thought, I don't want my dad to have a way to get information because we're sneaking out. I don't want him to be able to go to these idols and they'll, they'll guide him if she believed in it. That would be the most I could see her do. But I think more than that is she felt that her husband had right to what he took, to the flocks, the, dirt, the girls, the children, that they were not all Levon's slaves and to be slaves because Jacob had worked for them. And so I think that may have been why she took the gods, was whoever has those gods, if the son-in-law has the gods of the father-in-law, then it shows he has the right, the title deed to what he has. So I kind of think that may have been a reason why she wanted it and maybe also to stop her dad from anything that she thought could help him find them because obviously she was in agreement, let's get out of here while he doesn't know what's going on. So we're gonna leave it here. We're gonna find out, does Levon find out they're gone? Does he come after them? Does he know where to go? Does he come after them? What happens? And if you've read ahead and you know the story, if and when he does catch up with them, and I'm tipping my hand, how does it go down? Is it a battle? Is it a bloodbath? Do we have a big problem on our hands? 
And I'll just encourage you, you may be looking at something in your life. You may be stepping out and going out unknown where, and you may be fearing something that could be coming at you. Do you need something to divine? No. Go to your God. Ask Him. Let Him lead you. Where He leads you, He will protect you. Where God guides, He provides. He is with you, and you don't need to fear what could come out uh, come at you. You don't need to fear even if Satan gives them good advice. You don't need to fear anything. <clears throat> God will take care of you. If you are where He wants you to be, you're in the center of His will, He will take care of you. He'll take care of whatever you're facing. You need not fear. We have 365 verses in Scripture to fear not, do not be afraid, etc., etc., you can take a brand new one every day of the year and not run out till a whole year has gone by of God encouraging us. Don't fear. Step out in faith. Follow God. If he's put a desire in your heart, the circumstances are telling you it's time to move forward, take that step. Be brave. Step forward in the security of the Lord, that he is with you and he'll take care of you. So if you haven't read the story, you don't know what happens, Obviously, you know, Jacob's going to be protected by the Lord. But how does it go down and what's the, the final consequences and, and what all, you know, we'll tie up our story because next week when we get through it, we won't hear about Levon after that. I'll tell you that much too, okay? Hopefully I've whetted your appetite to come back next week and to hear, but I also hope and trust that this is relevant to you today is the living word of God. It's not just history folks it's living today and it's here for our betterment so i trust you are better and richer in the word of god for your life i know i am for my life let's close in prayer once again we praise and thank you the god of our fathers the god of abraham yitzhak and yaakov abraham isaac and jacob we thank you that you are the one true and living god that you are alive today and you are our God. If we put you in our hearts through receiving your atoning work, your shed blood in our place, then we can say you are our God and we are your people. And we can thank you that you do provide, protect, guide, and lead no matter what is happening in, to us in this world. Yes, Lord, we know that the tribulation and trials and sores, troubles will come to us, but we thank you that you are above it all, that you're not losing control and that we need only follow your guidance and you will bring us through, that you promise you won't let the waters overwhelm us, go over our heads, you won't let the fire burn us, that you will be with us. Lord, you've shown yourself faithful from time immemorial, from the very beginning and even the promises into the future, and we thank you for them. May this today now build our faith, um, increase our faith in a way that we will act accordingly that that as we enter into uh, the unknown we will do it by faith we will put feet to our actions that uh, to what you're putting in our heart to do trusting that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path and we thank you that you will bring us home safely one day for all of eternity to be with you forever and ever Hallelujah. We praise you and we thank you. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen.